We are so thankful today before the Lord. He said, come into his courts with praise and thanksgiving into his gates with praise. And we're thankful that the Lord has given us a, a thought to put on our heart and mind to bring to you. We're glad that it's our opportunity to give you the word of God. And we thank you for meeting with us here at this place so that you can share with us and I can share with you that which God has placed on our heart. And we pray one for another that the Lord will be glorified and honored therein. We trust you will turn in your Bibles to the book of John. The book of John, chapter number 14. We want to speak on the comforter. So this means that the comforter is going to have to bring the message about the comforter. The Holy Spirit is going to have to bring a message about himself. And I trust that it will be glorifying to him and edifying to us. The Holy Spirit is a person just as much as Christ and the Father. The Son and the Father are persons. And uh, we want to honor him and respect him. And we're thankful to the Lord Jesus Christ that he praised the Father that he would send us the Holy Ghost. And he did. And we're so thankful to the Father that he would send us the Son to pray for us concerning these things. He has not left us without the comforter. He will not leave us as orphans. He will come to us, and he has come to us. He said, uh, this is a verse in chapter 14 of John, verse uh, number 19. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. So he said, ye see me. Uh, so he tells us that he's going away, and he, we wouldn't be able to see him after that, but we shall see him. What does that mean? It means the physical person of the incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ, was going to be gone away into heaven. But we would be seeing him in the appearance of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. So to have the Holy Spirit is to have Christ. To have Christ is to have the Father. And to, to have salvation is to be introduced and uh, be controlled and directed and indwelt by all three of, of the Trinity, which is just one person. Hard to understand sometimes. Hard to explain, but we know that it's true. John 14, verse 22. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. There was two Judases. This is not Judas Iscariot. Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Great question. You say go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature then what about those uh, that are not the elect? If they hear it, what, what's our responsibility in that? Uh, he, how in the world are you going to speak to us and not to the world? And Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my, keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. What kind of answer is that? It's a tremendous answer. It says those who hear God's words and love him, and you can't love God except the Holy Spirit has birthed you into the kingdom of God and given you a hunger and thirst for righteousness' sake and opened your eyes to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So loving God will make you love his word and that will cause the word to be amplified to those who love him. There may be somebody sitting right next to him on a bench in a, a church or whatever, and they don't love the Lord, but they're hearing the same message. They don't get it. But it's, it goes into their outer ears. And we're going to look at some scriptures where Jesus said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Well, then you have to understand he's not talking about uh, natural, physical uh, ability to hear and listen and perceive and understand. He's talking about he who has a heart to perceive and to hear and to hear with a, 
the inner ear and hear the effectual word of God, you will be able to have the word come to you, whereas somebody, maybe your friend, maybe somebody kin to you, maybe somebody close to you that don't have any love for God, they don't understand the thing you're talking about or a thing that the Holy Spirit is saying. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. 1 Corinthians 13 says, Love believeth all things. If I have somebody come up to me every, after every message, and I used to have a man like this, he would come up and say, But preacher. And I thought, well, here's a goat. He's always butting. He's wanting to butt you all the time. Well, that may be true, but preacher. Folks, listen. God's people receive and hear and, and enjoy the word of God. They, they relish the opportunity to hear the word of God. The world thinks, I got to sit under that preacher. He's going to do what? Preach an hour? I don't want to do that. <clears throat> they don't love the Lord. Dear soul, listen, <clears throat> if you are thirsty and dying of thirst and you're out in the desert and everything is dead and dry, if somebody was to show up with a Campbell's soup can full of water, you'd take it. It don't matter what the vessel is. It matters that the water is life-giving. Dear soul, it doesn't matter about the preacher. It matters about the word that God's given you. And are you receiving it from the Lord? That's the difference. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. That's the answer. They hear, the world hears, but they're not going to keep it because they don't love him. That's the whole thing. Give me a definition of God in three words. God is love. So if God is in you, then you have that love of God or God the love in you. And you will want to hear and understand and perceive everything you can in the spiritual realm concerning your Lord. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. You don't have to worry about it. They can hear everything you hear. It's not a secret. Go out there and preach it to all, uh, every creature. Doesn't make any difference. Uh, they don't come in with a, a R on their head and says reprobate. Or the others don't come in with an E on their head saying elect. They're just people. All of sin comes short of the glory of God. Preach the word to all of them. Well, what if they're reprobate? It don't make any difference. Listen, God has a purpose for the preaching of the word to both groups. Those who in, in, inherit uh, eternal life and those who are put into the pits of the damned forever. That word will judge them if they don't receive it, or that word will bless them and enhance their souls and mature them if they do. So preach the word to everyone, and it's the love of God in their hearts that determines, or the lack of love of God in their hearts, that determines whether they can hear it and perceive it or not. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. God the Father sent the Lord Jesus Christ, calls him the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So God presents the Word through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ goes back into heaven and tells us, I will pray the Father that he will send you another comforter. Wow. You mean there's two? Yes. Yes. The person of the Lord Jesus Christ is, uh, is, is, is a comforter to us. And the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Truth. And Jesus Christ is the truth. So this is all one. Jesus is not different than the Father. He said, I and the Father are one. And the Holy Spirit is not some different entity than Jesus Christ. He said, he shall take of mine and show it unto you. There's only one God. Three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, unique in their personalities, distinctive in the scriptures, but one God. So he says, the world won't ever see me again, but you will see me. 
You say, when have we seen Christ? Do you have the Holy Spirit in your heart? Has he ever showed you anything? Have you ever learned anything about Christ that, that changed your life and caused all things to become new in your soul? Yes. Then you saw it. These things have I spoken unto you, being present, being yet present with you. Now, verse 26, here's our lesson. But the comforter, now listen, you don't need a concordance, you don't need a dictionary, a Bible dictionary. Listen to this. This is the words of Jesus Christ. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. That's it. The Comforter is the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> whom the Father will send in my name. What does that mean? He will send him on my account. He will send him in order to perfect my work. The work of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is all one. If you don't believe that, just read the first 12, 13 verses of Ephesians chapter 1. You'll find God the Father at work in his election, choosing us in Christ from before the foundation of the world. God the Son at work, redeeming us in time. He says in John 17, Father, all thine and sovereign election are mine in redemption. I will redeem all those that you elected in me. Not one will fall short of it. I will bring them all in. And then the Holy Spirit, if you'll read on down in Ephesians chapter 1, he will seal us, S-E-A-L, seal us until the day of redemption so that you cannot finally fall away, so that that which the Father did before time began will not fail because the Holy Spirit is going to seal those that the Father elected or chose us in Christ. And all those for whom Christ died, not a one shall come up short of being redeemed by the work of the cross 2,000 years ago. Why? Because the Holy Spirit will seal, S-E-A-L, will seal them. He puts God's stamp of approval on them and seals them with the king's seal, and they cannot finally fall away. Salvation is absolutely certain to all those that the Trinity has determined to bring to them. Isn't that something? That's, a, that's amazing. You say, well, I knew a man that really started out, you know, for the Lord, and he, he joined the church, and he was baptized, and he came, and he worked, and he did all kinds of things, but then finally one day, I don't know what happened to him, he just said, I've had enough of this, and he walked away. You say, well, he lost his salvation. Let me tell you something. He never had it. You can't lose that which will not let you go. When, when my children were little, they didn't hold my hand when we walked across a busy intersection. I held their hands. And dear soul, that's the way it is. I learned a lesson in that. God the Father holds on to me through God the Son, by God the Holy Spirit. And we cannot finally fall away. God is determined that he is going to have those that he pre-loved, pre-chose, that he chose and elected before the foundation of the world in his son. And Jesus Christ is saying to us that the son, is saying to us that the Holy Spirit uh, is going to uh, complete his work. He says, the Holy Spirit, but the comforter, let me get straightened out. John 14, 26. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. What does that mean? He will send him on my account. He will send him to perfect my work. The work of God is not finished as far as salvation is concerned in the application of it in the hearts of God's people until the Holy Spirit has done his work. Jesus Christ secured salvation. He, he, he died and obtained salvation for us. But it's still got to be applied. It's got to be made effectual in the hearts and lives of those that the Father chose, that the Son died for, 
and the Holy Spirit will now seal them. And Jesus is telling us he is going to be another comforter like myself. Do you believe in God? Jesus said in John 14 in this very chapter, then believe also in me. So we believed in the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all those back there in those days. But here comes Jesus Christ and he's saying, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. So the, the Father is manifest in Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus Christ has gone back into heaven. Well, now what do we do? We believe in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. We believe in God the Father by Jesus Christ. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and my Father are one, John chapter 10 and verse 30. There's no difference in us. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then the Holy Spirit comes not to make a different salvation, not to present a different God, but to continue in this same work of God the Father and God the Son, and the Holy Spirit seals us and brings us into a relationship with God the Father and Son by himself. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name to fulfill my work, to complement that which I have done, send him on my account. He's not going to let this thing fall. Listen, he shall teach you all things have you ever learned anything about God? Well, let me tell you something. You might have heard a preacher say it. You might have heard a teacher teach it to you. You might have, you might have read it in the scriptures. But if you really have it and believe it and it's yours, you got it by the Holy Spirit, period. What amazes me is that I, I preach my brains out for years to the same group and later they'll come up to me four or five years later and say guess what God just showed me and, and they tell you something that you've been preaching to them for all those years it, and you just have to you just have to make sure you don't want, you don't choke them you know <laughs> I'm excited to tell you that it's just like the little kid wants to spend the night with her friend down the street. And she comes home the next morning and said, Mama, guess what I learned? <laughs> and she tells her something that the lady down the street talked to uh, told her that she didn't uh, that she didn't learn from her mother who her mama who had been teaching her that for years. Or she comes home saying, Boy, Ms. Ms. Jones, she cooked so and so and boy, I really liked it. And, and she just piddled with it when you made it and wouldn't eat it. Uh, what I'm telling you is this. God the Father manifested himself in the old economy. Jesus Christ manifested himself as God in the new economy. And now the Holy Ghost is the only one that can bring it to you effectually and make it yours. Thank God for our preachers. God called preachers. 1 Peter 4.11 says they must preach as of the oracles of God. Let him that preacheth speaketh speak as the oracles of God. What does that or word oracles mean? Utterance. If there's not an utterance from God while I'm doing this, it's useless because I don't have the ability to make you understand it. You've got to go down to Ms. Brown's house and spend the night and hear it from somebody else. You've got to have the Holy Spirit bring it to you and teach it to you because they shall all be taught of God, not of me, not of preachers, not of teachers, not of missionaries. Yes, we set forth the truth, but only as the Holy Spirit applies that truth to every individual soul, do they ever get it? If you will carefully read John chapter 3 and verse 8, you will find out that yes, it's by the foolishness of preaching that men uh, believe, that men are saved. Why do they call it the foolishness of preaching? Because 
I just got through saying that it's by that foolishness of preaching that men believe. But the thing that is, by the foolishness of preaching, why is it called foolish? Because nobody is saved by hearing a man preach. They might be born again, quickened, regenerated, made alive, resurrected from the spiritual dead, uh, death of trespasses and sins while that's going on. But if they are, and when they are, it was done exclusively by the Spirit, according to John 3 and verse 8. The wind blows where it listeth, where it wills. What's the evidence? Well, I hear the sound thereof, but I can't tell where it comes from, where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Dear soul, everyone that is in heaven Everyone that shall be in eternal glory got there exclusively by the work of the Holy Spirit making application of that which Jesus Christ uh, purchased on the cross that the Father uh, sent him forth to do. It was done by the Holy Spirit. Everyone. I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit teaches and I learned to be patient and understand that I'm not all that important. Boy, preachers have a hard time with that. If I said it, it's true. You've got to believe it. Well, they may have said it, and it may be true. But they need to understand that nobody understands apart from the Holy Spirit exclusively. The Holy Spirit exclusively. So he says, these things have I spoken to you being yet present with you, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name on my account, he shall teach you all things. Have you ever learned anything effectually in your heart about God? Then the Holy Spirit did it. That's what, the, that's what this says. He shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. You have to learn, dear soul, that although you've been a Bible student for years, you can't just go up to somebody and just rattle off some, uh, some scriptures that you memorized a long time ago. They may be uh, sows, and God said, don't cast your pearls before them. You, you, you may find out that there's some people that God won't let you witness to. God shut your mind down. And if you do have opportunity to witness to anybody, you say, boy, Lord, I hadn't thought about those scriptures in years, in months. But all of a sudden they came out of me. Why? Because the Holy Spirit would use you as his servant and as his steward to say to them with a physical sounding of your voice by the Holy Spirit invisible in you, bringing forth those things of your remembrance. And you can say, as those disciples said, did not our hearts burn within us while he opened unto us the scriptures, by the way? And dear soul, when you are used of the Holy Spirit to cause other people's hearts to burn within them, you are highly blessed. But you better not be like the little boy who stuck in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, oh, what a good boy am I. You didn't do it. The Holy Spirit did it through you. Yes, you did it. But it wasn't you. Give all the glory to God. Come into his presence with thanksgiving. Come into his gates with praise. In all things, give thanks. It belongs to the Lord. Be thankful that he used you. Thank you, Lord, that you brought that to my remembrance. But don't be patting yourself on the back because five minutes before that you couldn't even quote John 3.16. It was the Lord doing that. And dear soul, I have to face that every week. And sometimes the Lord will bring me down to the deadness uh, of, of my mind and of the flesh. Right down to the wire when it's time for me to get ready and get over here and, and, and come and bring you something. And I don't have anything. And it's because the Lord would make me know you don't have anything. I will take care of it. 
And I like that verse. It reminds me of the mama bird poking a worm down into those little uh, little sparrows' hearts, uh, mouth, excuse me, as they're in that nest holding their mouth up and chirping and wanting to be the one that the mama puts something to eat it down in their beak. It says, open your mouth widely and I'll fill it with good things. That ain't exactly the quote here again. I'm proving to you what I'm saying to you. I can't remember that verse. But I do know that there is a, that impression, and that's a lot of times that which the Holy Ghost does. He makes impressions upon you. He will call things to your remembrance by hearing a different sound somewhere or seeing a, a, a beautiful scene or hearing a, a, a piece of music. And God will flood your mind with things that you hadn't thought about, but it, it comes back to you and you just have to bow your head and worship and say, thank you, Lord, for revealing that to me. And you don't have to be in church to receive that. Some of the sweetest messages I've ever heard me preach was driving down the expressway with the Holy Spirit just really preaching in my head and I could, I could just hear the words one after another, one sentence after another, and, and it's like I was preaching the word to myself and it was just precious, but it was the Holy Spirit. So we understand and see that this thing is spiritual. Uh, it, it has to be because it's contained and it's manifest by the Holy Spirit. He shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. Now, we take that personal, and I just did, and said God helps me remember stuff. Wait a minute. Keep that. Don't, don't throw it away. But think about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John having to write all these accounts that we call the Gospels, how did they get it right? How did they remember that? You know, I'm asked, do you remember so-and-so? And I said, no. I have to take a list with me to the grocery store or, or things that I know we need I can't remember. When I get in that grocery store, bam, my mind goes blank. Step outside the grocery store and get in your car to drive off, and you say, oh, I was supposed to get so-and-so. And, and, and so, no, I don't have the, the ability to remember natural things, but these guys had to remember all of this. The words that Jesus spoke, that's important. It's the word of God the Word. It's the word of God the Father speaking through God the Son by God the Holy Spirit. You can't just say, well, I think he said. It said, Jesus said unto them. How did they remember all that stuff? You do realize that some of these gospels were written some 95 years, uh, 95 A.D. Uh, and, and, and how did they remember? The Holy Spirit. He's the one that brought you your Bible. They couldn't remember all that. Well, was it Mary or Martha? Well, you know, well. When did uh, it happen that Lazarus was raised? Was it before or after the centurion came to him and said, I have a sick servant? How do you remember all that? Holy Spirit, dear soul, the one agent who has prospered the true church. I'm not talking about denominationalism. I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about people that memorize the scripture in their head but have nothing in their heart. I'm talking about God's true, elect, spirit-led, spirit-filled people. That has continued down through the centuries since the Lord Jesus Christ sent the Holy Ghost on Pentecost uh, exclusively by the Holy Spirit. Wherever the gospel went, went from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to Antioch and to here, there, and yonder, and off it went. How did it go that way? When did it know to move? How did it, how did it understand what God has said through the prophets? O oh, fools and slow to heart to believe all that the prophets have said unto you, how that Jesus Christ must suffer and then enter into his glory. That's what the whole Bible is about, two subjects. 
Jesus Christ came to suffer. Jesus Christ came to enter into his glory. The cross and the crown, that's what the whole thing's about. But what do we do? Well, we've got to start a Bible school. We've got to start a Bible college. You know, we want these people to learn about eschatology. What in the world is that? Well, we want them to, to learn about this, that, and the other. And, and, and our denomination and our religion believe strongly in this, but not in that. And the other one says, our religion believes strongly in that, but not in this. That's people taking the word of God mentally, without the spirit, and forming religious legalism and naming it a denomination and leading us all down the pathway of the, uh, of the Broadway into the depths of hell. Dear soul, there's nothing any more damning than religion apart from the Holy Spirit. Say amen. I was involved in religion as a young, young, young man, and, and God let me walk down an aisle and get baptized, and yet I was without God, without hope in the world, and didn't realize what I had done and what they had done. I just knew they, they was all happy with me, so I guess it was all right. But thank God the Holy Spirit came to me one night on my bed and scared me to death and made me know that you are straight, you're headed straight to hell, boy, if you don't get right with God. And I thought I was right with God. And the Holy Spirit quickened me and made me alive and caused me to understand and see the first thing that I saw was my sin. And he shall convince the world of sin. That's what the Holy Spirit is said to do. Jesus said that's what, would, that, that's what he would have. He said, and when he is come, John 16, 8, and when he, the Holy Spirit, is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And brother, I mean to tell you, he did. And I understood and, and, and knew that all that stuff that I had been counting on and depending on was just my selfish, sinful efforts. It was efforts of the flesh through the harlot church. And this old, when I got saved, genuinely regenerated, born again, you know what? I thought they'd all be happy for me, but they got upset. Because it messed up their records. Because they'd already counted me and told the associational missionary that, yeah, he was baptized and we turned in so many baptisms for this year. Well, they had to race that one out. Well, it never should have been put in. Because it wasn't the church, it wasn't the baptism waters that saved me. It was the Holy Spirit. And dear soul, it was the Holy Spirit that refrained from bringing me into the kingdom of God and seeing the things of the glory of God for seven years in order that I might understand and perceive the difference between religion's salvation and the true salvation of the Holy Spirit. And that has helped me immensely in my ministry. And it's helped me immensely in understanding the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. It makes me understand the difference between the sheep and the goats. It makes me understand the difference between the bad tree and the good tree. It causes me to understand the things of the parables and perceive and understand and know because I have experienced them lost without God, without hope in the world, but with a sinful, wrongful confidence that I was a Christian and I was not. Let's go on. Listen. Verse 27, John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Let me tell you what it's not. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. And he repeats what he said in verse number one. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And one of the verses, or one of the uh, actual little phrases in the verse, in a verse, that has really come to mean a lot to me after I finally understand what it was saying, it said, 
be careful for nothing. Wait a minute. I have to be careful about a lot of stuff. It's not saying be careful when you cross the street or be careful when the light changes uh, to, to green because some idiot may be going to run the uh, yellow light and you get clobbered. It means be anxious for nothing. That, that word is anxious. What does that mean? It means no matter what God brings me in life, it is brought to me by my Father. And it's like God bringing all the animals in, into, uh, unto Adam to see what he would call them. And he did a pretty good job. I don't know of a better name for a cow than cow to you. So God will bring things by you, test you out, try you out, and, and, and give you opportunity to pass this hands-on test. Here we are. You're standing at, at, at a graveside. Be anxious for nothing. You're standing at a marriage altar. Be anxious for nothing. Well, I don't know how to, uh, to be a husband. I'm, I'm a man. And I'm a son, but I'm not a husband. I don't know how to be a wife. And then here comes, here you come to the birthing center or the hospital or whatever, and you stand there looking at that little red wrinkled lizard-looking creature, and they say, that's your daughter. That's your son. What? And where are the instructions? How do I know how to do this? Be anxious for nothing. Why? Because Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. God will not let it be above it being common to man. It will not be allowed to be that kind of temptation, that supernatural temptation that he underwent when the devil tempted him and took him up on a high mountain, took him up on a pinnacle of the temple after he was almost starved to death after 40 days and 40 nights of not eating, giving him stones and say, make bread. You will not have temptations like that. Your temptations will be common to man. And also with, will, with the temptation, God will, will uh, make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. Why? Because the middle part of that verse says God is faithful. What do you mean God is faithful? He is faithful so that your temptations are not uh, but common to man. He is faithful in that he will not allow your peace which is Christ's peace that he gives you in that moment, can be broken. Now, you've got to learn some things. You're standing there at a casket. You're there in a funeral. And maybe it's your grandmother or granddaddy, or maybe it's your mother or dad. And, and you've got this nothingness inside of you. And you, you get worried, you say, I, everybody's crying and carrying on. Well, how, what am I supposed to be feeling? I must be terrible that I'm not weeping. And Don't work against Christ's peace. Again, let me tell you something. Christ's peace in you feels like nothing. That's God causing you to be careful, to be anxious for nothing. And you say, well, I got this great job, but I don't feel any different. Yeah, I'm happy, I'm glad. Or the boss told me I got a raise on the job that I had. And you're happy about it, and you're glad to tell your wife or husband or whatever about it. Don't tell your kinfolk because if they find out you got more money, here they come. Excuse me for that foolishness. But dear soul, what I'm trying to say to you is that there's going to be a lot of things in life that you're going to say, something must be wrong with me. I don't feel anything. That's your peace. Be anxious for nothing. A lot of stuff is going to happen to you. 
a lot of stuff is going to come down the pike, and it's going to upset your life, going to upset your world. But God said, my peace I give unto you. Do you not know that the three Hebrew children got a good night's sleep laying on them, on them, on those lawns, manes? No, that was Daniel, wasn't it? Yeah, excuse me. Three Hebrew children got cast into the fiery furnace. They, what were they doing? Walking around with the fourth man. Who was the fourth man? It was God the Son. What did the fire burn off? The cords that bound them. God will make everything that the devil throws at you work together for your good. Romans 8, 28. Don't be alarmed. Learn to go with the Holy Spirit. Don't quench him. Don't grieve him. Don't keep on trying to work emotions up at that funeral until you get a little tear out. You just grieve the Holy Spirit. He gave you peace. Well, made me feel funny. I didn't want peace and you know, and everybody think I didn't care. There you go with your stinking thinking. Listen, dear friend, God gave Jesus Christ perfect peace at Lazarus' tomb. He wept, but it wasn't weeping over Lazarus being dead. It was weeping because Mary and Martha and all the rest of them didn't believe in him. He told them over and over again, I am the resurrection. The resurrection is not an event. It's a person, and it's me. And you're going to see the glory of God. And then he just quietly, silently, you know, approaches the tomb, and then he prays. Uh, he's already prayed to the Father, and he calls Lazarus forth, and he came forth. He didn't jump up and down and say, Do y'all get that on film? Make sure that's being shown on my, you know, YouTube internet channel. And what about the, our message last week, Behold a Dead Man? What did he do after he raised that boy from the dead? He delivered him to his mother, and he went on his journey. You, 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 you got to understand there, so the Holy Spirit needs to be sensed. He needs to be cooperated with. You need to get away from what Adam has taught you, from what your family has taught you, from what your flesh says you need to do. Well, I ought to be crying and carrying on and wailing. No, that's those guys over in the East that beat themselves and hit themselves and cut themselves until it's squishy with blood. Oh, look how much you must have loved. You're an idiot, man, for doing that to yourself. You must not know the Lord. Because I went through that same thing with one of my kin folks, and God gave me great peace. What's wrong with that? My peace I give unto you. Not as the world I, uh, gives, giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Don't let your heart be troubled or afraid. Well, this pandemic has done killed 800,000 people, and now it's done generated again it I'm scared the stock market's going to crash don't bother me none because I don't have no stock even if I did this so uh, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of things which he possesses what is the greatest gift that you could have what is the greatest possession that could be yours God's only son. Romans 8, 32. And I, I can quote it, but I can mess it up too. Let me read it to you. Romans chapter 8. And verse, verse number 32. Verse 31 says, If God be for us, who can be against us? Listen. He that spared not his only son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Do you have a need? Ask, and it shall be given. 
do you have a, uh, a d desire for uh, an entrance into something? Not, and it shall be open unto you. Do, do you have something that's lost to you? Seek, and you shall find. This old, listen, we need to learn how to adhere to the voice of the Holy Spirit. Quietly, silently leading us. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 30. The book of Isaiah, chapter 30, and verse 20. Isaiah 30, and verse number 20. Okay, go back up to verse 18. Isaiah 30, 18. Therefore will the Lord wait that he may be gracious unto you. Why is the Lord doing something? Because he's got something better coming for you. And in your patience possess ye your souls. So be patient. And therefore will he be exalted that he may have mercy upon you. That's why he's waiting, to exalt himself with greater mercy for you. For the Lord is a God of judgment. Blessed are all they that wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem. Thou shalt weep no more. He will be very gracious unto thee at the voice of thy cry. When he shall hear it, he will answer you. And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, you shall, yet shall not thy teachers be removed into a corner any more, but thine eyes shall see thy teachers. Amplified reads, Thine eyes shall see the teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you want a personal relationship with the person of Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, the Lord of Lords, and the King of Kings? You said, oh yes. You're going to have to learn how to be sensitive to the Spirit of God's voice and learn to not try to be woeful and sorrowful and upset when everybody else is when God has given you Christ's peace. Verse 31, Isaiah 30, 31. And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand, uh, and when you turn to the left. Dear soul, God speaks to his people. One of the most horrible things I ever heard from a local pastor in the Sovereign Grace Movement, he stood in his pulpit and said, you cannot hear from God unless I'm in this pulpit preaching to you. That's awful. Well, you going to follow them around? You going to go to their job with them? You you're going to you're going to go to the hospital with them when they visit their sick relatives? Are you going to be with them through everything? You you you, you can't say that. This all that's a lie. But he was saying people are saying, "Well, the Holy Spirit led me to do." And he said it gets wild and they say things that that ain't true. Well, I I understand that. I know there are people and there are times when people think that it's the Holy Spirit leading them and they get in a mess. But that'll teach them. That'll teach me. That'll teach us. And you learn the voice of the Holy Spirit. And when you can say, thus saith the Lord. And this old, he said, I'm going to tell you this. You shall hear a word behind you. Because your teacher shall not be put in a corner anymore. But with thine eyes shall thou see thy teacher. And you shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way, walk ye in it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way. So the Holy Spirit is just telling you to walk with Christ and showing you how to walk with Christ. Showing you where to walk with Christ, how and when to walk with Christ. This is the way, walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. I don't know which way to go, right or left. The Holy Spirit will teach you. 
But you've got to learn to listen to him. You've got to learn to quit listening to the voice of reasoning and religion. Uh, I'm going to get in trouble. You, you, did you just say you've got to learn to quit listening to the voice of religion? I sure did. It's not religion that tells you what to do from God on the outside. It's the Holy Spirit that tells you what to do and when to do it by the Holy Spirit on the inside. And that's what my example was earlier in this lesson when I said I have preached something over and over and over again to people and then they'll come up to me a month later and say, guess what the Lord just showed me? That's what I'm talking about. And the Lord had to tell me, you're not God. You are an implement and an instrument of my redemption. I will use you. But it has to be done by the Holy Spirit. And dear soul, uh, one man got really upset with me for me saying this, but it's true. God didn't even take a crooked stick and draw a straight line with it. The Holy Spirit can take things that uh, are, are, as far as other people are concerned, they would judge you and say, well, that couldn't have been the Lord because you was over yonder in that other denomination or whatever. Dear soul, God used a rooster <laughs> to wake up Peter. God used a jackass, a donkey, to wake up Balaam. Uh, it, 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 God will speak as he wills. But what he will do is to say, do you recognize my voice? And did you hear that word behind you saying, this is the way? And it won't be contrary to the scriptures. It may be contrary to some old legalist that's in, even in your church, even in your assembly. Well, you, that couldn't have been the Lord because rah, 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 rah. God can take a crooked stick and draw a straight line. You better learn to listen to the Lord and do what God says. Oh, my soul, thank God for the Holy Spirit. You need to get acquainted with him. You need to understand that he's the one that can open up the scriptures to you and, and present you with the way of the Lord Jesus Christ and bring you on into the greatness and glory of God. You have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I go unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. John 10, 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. John 14 and verse 28, my Father is greater than I. Which one's truth? Both of them. Jesus Christ considered in the Trinity he is co-equal, co-powerful, co-eternal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He and the Father are one. But when he subordinates himself and comes and takes on the sin of his bride, when he subordinates himself to God the Father and takes upon him the image and responsibility of the Lamb of God to take away the sin of their world, the Father is greater than him and he listens to what the Father says and, uh, and, and accomplish it for us. And now I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Isn't that something? The Lord Jesus Christ laid out all of this in these beautiful passages in John chapters 12 through 16 about the Holy Spirit and himself. And he teaches us these things in our head. They get into our ears. But then the Holy Spirit has to come, and you have to learn. Ladies, maybe your mama sat you down before your wedding day and say, now this is what it's like to live with a man. Gentlemen, maybe husbands, maybe your daddy sat you down before your wedding day and said, now this is what you're going to find out in living with a woman. 
but you didn't really come to understand and know that until you actually got into that situation and then you said, oh yeah, I related wrongly to her or to him. But now I remember my mama or my daddy saying this is how it was going to be. Or maybe you didn't have that realization. Maybe you had to go weeping back over to your mama's house on Saturday morning and sit down and drink a cup of coffee with her and, and say, Mama, who's doing so and so? And the mama just smiles and looks at her and said, I told you. And then you say, oh, yeah. And it dawns on you. Dear soul, thank God for preachers. Thank God for missionaries. Thank God for teachers. Uh, thank God for evangelists. Thank God for the scriptures. But above all things, thank God for the Holy Spirit. Because he's the only one that will keep all of that from messing you up. How many people have been messed up by preachers? How many people have been messed up by missionaries? How many people have been messed up by churches and church anity and religion? Dear soul, that, that man that Jesus gave him his sight, they threw him out of the temple. But guess who he ran into? I think it's the ninth chapter of John. Guess who he ran into? Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ brought him on into an understanding of God greater than he ever had before. He received his natural sight. It got him in trouble. Got thrown out of the church. And dear soul, that, was a, that, that meant they consigned him to hell. But out there, outside, without the gate, he ran into Jesus. And that's where things really got sweet. I know our time is about gone. Let me read you something in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. We have an altar, verse 10, whereof they have no right to eat which serves the tabernacle. Those that are still in Judaism, they don't have a right to eat at our altar. We have an altar? Yeah, keep reading. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, the bodies are burned outside the camp. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people, the people with his own blood, suffered without or outside the gate of Jerusalem. Let us go, therefore, unto him without the camp, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here have we no continuing city, but we seek one to come. And he says, but by him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Dear soul, you're going to have to learn to come outside the gate, come outside the camp. Well, that don't feel right. It didn't say feelings. It said faith. The just shall live by faith. You said, oh, yeah, I know that. No, you don't. You, you're going to have to learn to walk with God by faith, not walk with the God you thought, you had to walk with because of religion and not walk with with what you thought was what the preacher and the church entity had taught you. But dear soul, you are the sole responsibility now of the Holy Ghost. You need to get acquainted with him and you need to be able to hear his voice and you need to be able to say this is, the, you know, that is the way. I, I hear this is a voice behind me saying, this is the way walk ye therein when you turn to the left hand or to the right. It's not going to be the preacher going to be with you all the time. You can be thankful for that. And your mom and daddy ain't going to be able to be with you all the time. The, the only one that's going to be there with you when you breathe that last breath is the Holy Spirit. The only one that's going to be able to ha have you walk in true Spiritual Christianity is the Holy Spirit. God the Father said, done my work. I elected you. 
God the Son said, I, I've, did my, I've, I've done my work. I redeemed you. The Holy Spirit said, okay, come on, boy. It's now time for me to do my work, and you need to learn how to hear my voice and to walk with God. And if I give you peace in the middle of a funeral, don't you sit there saying, I don't feel right. Because God's peace feels like nothing. And you sit there and you say to the Lord, thank you, the Lord. I may be the only one in this whole funeral home that has the peace of God. And I'm going to not sorrow as others who have no hope. Ain't God good. I hope this has been a blessing to you and the Holy Spirit has helped you as he introduces you to the Comforter. God bless you. Thank you.